1946. Much of Europe lies in ruins as its inhabitants start the task of rebuilding a continent after the horrors of the Second World War. At Nuremberg, the victorious allies put the leaders of Nazi Germany on trial for crimes against humanity. In Britain, this first summer since the war saw the mainline stations crowded with people. It was a stunningly sunny season, and there was a feeling of giddy relief everywhere. The Serpentine in Hyde Park reopened for swimmers. Among the people single-mindedly intent on enjoying themselves was Marjorie Gardner. She was an habitué of Kensington and Soho clubs, where she met a handsome ex-officer named Neville Heath and started a brief affair with him. Together, they visited the night spots which were reopening in London and stayed in various hotels. She enjoyed masochism, and the manager of one hotel had to be called when screaming was heard during their lovemaking. They spent their last night together, the 20th of June, at the Pembridge Court Hotel in Notting Hill. The self-styled Lieutenant Colonel Heath had earlier booked in with another lady and had signed the register as man and wife. Heath left the hotel sometime during the early morning of the 21st of June. During the afternoon, Marjorie Gardner was found in room four by a chambermaid. She was dead, hidden under blood-stained bedclothes with her ankles tied together. On her body were the marks of 17 whip lashes and her nipples had been bitten off. Marjorie, an occasional extra in British films, had suffered other ravages which went far beyond the masochistic game she liked to play. There was an immediate hue and cry for Colonel Heath. Local forces were alerted by the police gazette using a photograph not released to the press so that it couldn't be suggested that eyewitnesses had been prompted. Both the dead woman and the missing man were on police files. She had recently been in a stolen car and was known to consort with pimps and pushers. He had a long record of fraud. Their movements the day before, dancing in a club and subsequently drinking heavily together, were easily traced. Soon word came from the south coast that he was in the area of Worthing in Sussex. He had gone to see a girl who thought she was his fiancée and with whom he had signed into the Pembridge court, Miss Yvonne Simons. When they met, he explained that he had become involved in the murder which was all over the press because he had lent his room to a friend who was looking for somewhere to go with a girl. When he returned to the room, he found the girl dead in it and horrified left immediately. Heath assured Yvonne of his innocence and said he was going back to London to see Scotland Yard. He didn't go to the Yard, but he did write a letter from Worthing to Superintendent Tom Barrett. In this, he set out his version of events. I feel it to be my duty to inform you of certain facts in connection with the death of Mrs. Gardner. I booked in last Sunday, but not with Mrs. Gardner, whom I met for the first time during the week. I had drinks with her on Friday evening, and whilst I was with her, she met an acquaintance with whom she was obliged to sleep. The reasons, as I understand them, were mainly financial. It was then that Mrs. Gardner asked if she could use my hotel room until two o'clock and intimated that I might spend the remainder of the night with her. I gave her my keys. 
It must have been almost 3 a.m. when I returned to the hotel and found her in the condition of which you are aware. I realized that I was in an invidious position and packed my belongings and left. Since then, I have been in several minds whether to come forward or not, but in view of the circumstances, I have been afraid to. I can give you a description of the man. He was aged approximately 30, dark-haired with a small moustache. His name was Jack, and I gathered he was a friend of Mrs. Gardner of some long standing. I have the instrument with which Mrs. Gardner was beaten, and I'm forwarding this to you today. You will find my fingerprints on it, but you should also find others as well. NGC Heath. Having posted the letter in Worthing, but not the whip which he kept, he decided he had better move along the coast. He chose to go to Bournemouth, where he could mingle easily with the wealthier type of holidaymaker who went to this resort. Among the holidaymakers already there was a 19-year-old former Wren named Doreen Marshall. With a friend, Peggy, she was strolling along the promenade when she caught the eye of a young man who introduced himself as Group Captain Rupert Brook. He said he had met Peggy at a dance, and perhaps for the sake of convention, Do, as she was nicknamed, believed him. Peggy, feeling that three was a crowd, departed, and Doreen and Group Captain Brook spent a pleasant day around the town that hot and sunny 3rd of July. Do accepted an invitation to tea at his hotel, the Tallard Royal, then dinner, and eventually late night drinks. By which time, Mrs. Gladys Davy Phillips, a fellow guest, remembered her looking distinctly tense and asking Mr. Davy Phillips, please order me a taxi. But Rupert Brooke canceled the order. He insisted on walking her home. I'll be back in half an hour, he said. Doreen had snapped, he'll be back in a quarter of an hour. Later, he was to say that the last time he saw her was after they had said good night at the pier. He had watched her walk into the gardens on the way to her hotel. This was the Norfolk. Doreen was recuperating from a bout of flu, and her father was paying for her to stay at this elegant five-star hotel. She never got there. Rupert Brooke hadn't been seen in his hotel lobby either. At 4 a.m., a puzzled night porter went up to his room. He was asleep there. Next morning, he explained that he had found a builder's ladder propped up against the wall and had decided to play a joke on the porter by climbing up it to his room. But the porter wondered if it wasn't because he didn't want to reveal the time of his return. When the manager of the Norfolk realized that his young guest hadn't been into meals or to sleep for 48 hours, he became very worried. She had last left in a taxi for the Tallard Royal, so he telephoned there and the manager of that hotel asked Group Captain Brook if the missing girl was the one who had dined with him. He suggested a call to the police. Rupert Brook agreed and offered to come to the police station and look at a photo to see if it really was her. He confirmed that it was and then said he thought she must have gone off with an American soldier she had been very friendly with. The policeman who interviewed him, Detective Constable Souter, felt there was something a bit too eager about this smooth talking officer, but at first he could find very little wrong with his story. Group Captain Brook seemed totally at ease as he described how he had entertained Doreen to dinner and then set out to walk her part of the way home. He repeated that he had left her on the seafront near the pier and claimed to have seen her again in the town the next day. The group captain also repeated that he had played a practical joke in climbing up the ladder on the night Doreen Marshall went missing. But the detective also wondered whether the reason might have been the time and the fact that he was afraid to be seen returning so late.
As Brooke was leaving, Doreen's father suddenly arrived at the police station. Brooke was visibly shaken to meet him, and even more by her elder sister, who strongly resembled her. The detective noticed him start and had an inspiration. Isn't your name Heath, he asked. Certainly not, replied Brooke. But you look like the picture in the papers, Suter persisted. I suppose I do. People have commented on it, was the reply. Suter smiled. There had been no picture in the papers. Asking Brooke to wait, he checked the picture in the police gazette, which had never been made public. Now there was no doubt that they had found Neville Heath. Scotland Yard detectives hurried to Bournemouth, bringing his dossier with them. Just turned 29, he was the son of a barber who had scrimped to send him to a private school. More athletic than studious, he joined the Territorial Army at 17, and the following year, 1936, he left home in Ilford to enlist in the Royal Air Force. Within a year, he was flying officer Heath and had been posted to RAF Duxford. There he learned to fly and to attract the women he wanted, those that liked their men a little cruel and masterful. He also began living out his fantasies of being rich. To finance this lifestyle, he bounced checks and embezzled mess funds. He was caught cheating, but escaped from the guardroom and stole a sergeant's car. Picked up again, he was dismissed from the service, but not cured of his taste for high living and crime to support it. In 1938, he returned to military life by joining the Royal Army Service Corps. But before that, he was in and out of court for fraud and false pretenses and in Borstal for housebreaking. He also passed himself off as various aristocrats and was caught for impersonating Lord Dudley. The outbreak of the Second World War made the army overlook his previous offenses and he was again commissioned. In March of 1940, he embarked for the Middle East as a second lieutenant, where he fought against the Italian troops invading Egypt and helped to turn the tide so that British troops crossed into Libya. As the supply lines for the RASC became longer and more dangerous, his responsibilities increased and he was made an acting captain. Away from the battlefield, however, he was up to his old tricks. He managed to obtain a second paybook so that he was paid twice, and then he made the mistake of attempting to con a brigadier with dishonored checks. Placed under arrest, he went absent without leave, was tracked down, court-martialed, and cashiered. As Allied forces fought off the counter-attacks of Rommel's Africa Corps, Heath was packed off on a returning troop ship, which had to go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope. This gave him the chance to slip off the ship in Durban, where he passed himself off as Captain Selway, MC, of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. He got a girl named Elizabeth Pitt Rivers pregnant. As her family was rich, he happily married her, grabbed what he could, and soon said goodbye to her and their son, Robert. He applied to join the South African Air Force, telling them his name was Armstrong. By D-Day, he had been given a commission and seconded back to England as a bomber pilot. So impressed was the South African Air Force with his ability that even when they found out his real name and record, they let him stay. On one sortie, his plane was hit by flak and burst into flames over the Dutch-German border. He parachuted safely to Earth and escaped back to Allied lines. That exploit wasn't enough for him. After VE Day, he started pretending to be other people again, while still in the Air Force. In London, he was arrested once again for fraud, court-martialed on six different charges and cashiered again. That made three times. 
A few weeks before his encounters with Marjorie Gardner and Doreen Marshall, he was again fined for wearing unauthorized uniforms and decorations. Finally, on the 6th of July, 1946, Neville George Cleveley Heath was arrested for the murder of Marjorie Gardner. He had arrived at the police station in the heat of the day without jacket. Now rather chilly, he asked if his sports coat could be brought from his hotel. From the pockets, detectives took an artificial pearl, the return half of Doreen Marshall's rail ticket, and a cloakroom receipt issued at a Bournemouth station. When they redeemed it, they found a treasure trove. It was a suitcase containing a Macintosh, a hat with the name Heath inside, some clothing, and a blue woolen bloodstained scarf. Most significantly, there was a riding whip with a diamond weave and a ferrule-like hard tip. It fitted the markings on Marjorie Gardner's body exactly. Along with the suitcase, Heath was driven by detectives to London, where he was formally charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardner. But because he had not yet been formally involved with Doreen Marshall's disappearance, the newspapers discreetly ran their stories about his arrest and the hunt for her side by side, but were careful not to connect them. Then on the 8th of July in Bournemouth, a Miss Evans was taking her dog for a walk in Branksome Dean Chai. She noticed it sniffing at some bushes. Back at home, she described the incident to her father and they started to wonder whether the dog could have found the missing girl. They went back together and discovered, underneath a bush, covered by a camel hair coat and a black dress, the body of a girl. She was naked except for her left shoe, and she had been bludgeoned, raped, and savagely mutilated. Her hands were cut as if she had seized a blade. Nearby, police found a torn stocking, a powder compact, and a handbag. There was no doubt that it was the body of Neville Heath's dinner companion, the missing Doreen Marshall. Not far away was a broken string of artificial pearls. 27 of them were scattered around. The 28th was the one in Heath's pocket. The nation was shocked. Everyone knew that Neville Heath had been apprehended in Bournemouth for one savage murder. Could he have committed another one while on the run? It seemed stranger than fiction. The questions were quickly answered as police added the murder of Doreen Marshall to that of Marjorie Gardner on Heath's crime sheet. His first reaction was to plead guilty. Why shouldn't I, he asked his lawyers. After all, I did kill them. However, he was persuaded to plead not guilty. As the remand proceedings took place, Heath's counsel, Mr. J.D. Caswell, played on his feelings for his family, saying that they would be shattered if he admitted that he knew what he was doing while killing the women. So Heath agreed to go along with a defense attempt to prove partial insanity. Lawyers have since criticized this strategy. If the defense had proved willing participation in a sadomasochistic game, the crime could have been reduced to manslaughter. But in those days, there was a puritanical reluctance to admit that a woman might have wanted unusual sex, and Heath had been publicized as an ogre. The possibility of Marjorie Gardner's initial participation was not raised at the trial, which began on the 24th of September, 1946, at the Old Bailey. Heath himself took very little interest in the proceedings. He wrote to friends saying he didn't care what happened to him, and he may well have been planning suicide even before his arrest. The challenge thrown down by prosecuting counsel Anthony Hawke was for the defense to prove that Heath had a disease of the mind. 
His strategy was to emphasize Heath's long record of deceit and the appalling injuries inflicted on Marjorie Gardner. He emphasized how Heath must have come prepared with a riding whip in his suitcase, ready to inflict pain and punishment. He must also have brought a poker that was found there too, and which he used as a particularly nasty weapon for rape. And the deep marks of the whip indicated how much force must have been used. On the question of knowing right from wrong, Hawke asked why he had packed up and left the hotel unless he knew what he had done was wrong. The leading pathologist, Dr. Keith Simpson, testified that death was ultimately caused by suffocation, probably from a pillow. Although the trial was theoretically confined only to the murder of Marjorie Gardner, the second killing was brought in by the defense as confirmatory evidence of his state of mind. To end up so far from her hotel and in the opposite direction from it, Doreen Marshall must have been forced to accompany him to the lonely chine. When they got to his chosen spot, the absence of bloodstains on his clothes shows that he must have taken them all off. Most likely, he forced her to do the same under the threat of a knife or cutthroat razor. Then he inflicted a lethal rape on her, washed himself in the sea and threw the weapon in. Afterwards, he moved the body into the rhododendron bushes and ran back along the beach to his hotel. There he climbed in via the handy ladder some workmen had left outside. It was now obvious that he could not have risked passing the hotel porter. Dr. Henry Hubert, a psychiatrist called by the defense, failed to convince the jury that Heath didn't know he was doing wrong and that any lawbreaker was not guilty if a crime seemed to him to be right at the time. Now the jury took less than an hour to reach a verdict of guilty. The judge donned the black cap and sentenced Neville Heath to death. There were crowds, some come to gloat, some to protest, outside Pentonville Prison on the 16th of October, after the Home Secretary decided that there were no grounds to recommend a reprieve. Mrs. van der Elst, the veteran campaigner against capital punishment, claimed that fresh evidence she had should stop the execution, but all she achieved was to be arrested and fined for breach of the peace. Neville George Cleveley Heath dressed up for the occasion and was insouciant to the end. When Albert Pierpoint, the hangman, arrived, Heath drawled, come on boys, let's get on with it. He wrote to his parents, my only regret is that I have been damned unworthy of you both. He showed no remorse for his victims, whom he used to gratify his own pleasures and uncontrolled desires. The archetypal cab, for him, women were there to be used and discarded. Offered the traditional tot of whiskey to steady his nerves, Neville Heath, ever the bon viveur, held out his glass saying, while you're about it, old boy, considering the circumstances, you might make that a double. His effigy remains on display at Madame Tussauds as one of the most heartless and uncaring murderers in British history. <laughs>